We get a 
excited where you may not. But uh, if you watch as the plants grow from early spring on, you'll see the liators coming up in little clumps and you get to communing with them and you'll see uh, uh, purple cauliflower growing uh, and if it's growing in the, in the gravel pit you'll see open space the prairie rose will be growing uh, and flowering it, it's able to survive in many different habitats where some plants uh, only like a certain habitat uh, like root or, or ironweed would like to be a damp spot and we have a little creek in, at the Pope Prairie in, in Rantour but it, it's the same if you're in Savoy or other places a little bit uh, different in climate if you are in southern Illinois you're going to be earlier than here so uh, the timing depends on how far north you are. Uh, the grass is uh, sort of delayed action. They come into their peak more towards the, the fall. Uh, but right now, the uh, pale purple cauliflower is its stalks come up and they kind of look like wobbly children uh, and gradually they straighten out and then they have petals that are not like the commercial purple cauliflower they're, they're wimpy looking but they're very natural for a native uh, pale purple cauliflower the rue earlier has been out it's a prairie petunium and uh, Sometimes I've gone to uh, the little cemetery on St. Mary's Road, and if it's not mown soon, it you can see a, a field of uh, prairie petunias. So we get to know where there are some of these creatures. Uh, I'm going to look at my notes a little here. Uh, oh, I, I have a note here about Dame's Rocket. We have some friendly invaders, uh, and often they come from uh, uh, people dumping uh, garden plants along the road. Uh, one of them is Dame's Rocket, and Dame's Rocket is a crucifer. That means it's in the cabbage family and has four petals in a cross. And they're very... Uh, uh, they're very interesting flowers. Uh, people take photographs of them, and but we have to uh, remind them that this is not a prairie plant. But some people, when they see a bank of Dame's Rocket, then there's a temptation to uh, think that that's a prairie plant, and we get congratulations on the, on the, the flowering event, maybe on Route 10 or wherever. But, uh, we tend to uh, pick the flowers. They're, they're fresh enough that you can put them in a vase, but uh, we stop them from seeding. Uh, one of the ones that are coming up right now is bee balm. It's not quite flowering yet, uh, but if you go to Scott Park, you will not only see acres of uh, penstemon and some golden Alexander getting to be headed. Uh, and some purple cauliflower, you, you will see the uh, bee balm or monarder coming up. It's a, it's a mint. It has a four square stem, so you can feel the stem and you can take a, a leaf and check it out uh, for its aroma. Uh, aroma. Uh, uh, the next one that will come along, and I think it will be really strong, a little later than now is the Atris. It's a, a blazing star, and uh, it's doing very well at Grand Tour, and I think it does well elsewhere, because many photographs that you see of a prairie include blazing star Leatris. And uh, it's a purple plume. Uh, a lot of small flowers 
uh, on Arrakis that is uh, about uh, the thickness of a, a broom handle uh, and uh, high, about three or four feet. A uh, little dependent on what habitat they're in. If they're if they're on uh, uh, hard clay soil, they might not be that high. But in a good soil, they be they can be four feet high. Uh, the uh, their counterpart, button leatrus, comes a little later. It has flowers in little sites all the way up to stem. Uh, The, the, the selfims are, are special. Uh, if you uh, enter prairie, then they're sort of uh, iconic representatives of the prairie. Uh, I'll deal with a few uh, iconic flowers later, but they, they they come in for perfusion. If you're in a backyard in a banner or champagne and you... you uh, have one or two uh, prairie dock or compass plant, uh, then very shortly you will have more dock, and so will the neighbor. So they, they can be diplomats in the fact that they're tall and they can see, and people regard them as a popular prairie plant, but uh, you have to just watch so that they don't get too aggressive. Uh, The sylphims are a family, and two of them are deep-rooted, uh, like 10 and 15 feet roots, and some of them are shallow. Ross and wheat is shallow-rooted and more uh, a uh, conglomeration of roots at about six or seven inches down. If you want to move a ros and weed, you get shovels on either side and four of you push and up will come the rotten weed plant. Uh, you can't do that to a dock or a compass plant. Uh, moving on here, we have uh, the clovers coming in and uh, this is, they are uh, very nice at, at uh, Popperi and Rantoul. They uh, have moved around and uh, uh, their legumes, so they provide some nitrogen to the soil eventually when they plant nice. Uh, we don't have a lot of culvers root, but it likes to be in a damp site like where we have a little stream. Uh, in the drier places, you have rollers. I think I might have mentioned them already. We have tall coleopsis and we have short coleopsis. A tall coreopsis can be uh, eight feet tall, and uh, they too can be aggressive if you're uh, 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 not careful. Uh, it's New Jersey tea, which is a little more rare. It, for us, we have a, a, a New Jersey tea uh, area at uh, Seymour on Route 10, which is... Uh, very interesting because the seeds come together uh, a little later in the fall, but uh, it's uh, the seed is over a whole period. You can't harvest it on a certain day. It, you have to know that it survives because its seed comes at variable times. Uh, the rattlesnake master, rattlesnake master. Uh, is pollinated by, I think it's a wasp, and uh, it, it can be very rare or it can be uh, very strong, uh, depending on uh, who's doing what with it. Uh, but the rattlesnake master doesn't have a very brilliant flower. Uh, it uh, belongs to the carrot family, and... Uh, we have a number of carrot families. Uh, we, hemlock is another one of these uninvited weeds. It's a uh, European hemlock, and it's eight or so feet tall. But I have to 
remind people who are dealing with hemlocks that we also have a native hemlock. It's a, a much more modest in size and a little reddish in stem. And uh, I have to talk to Ron Slater, who, who has checked out on it and found that, yes, <laughs> he has been herbiciding uh, hemlocks that are native when he was really after hemlocks that are European, and they're probably a little about both. Yeah. It's quinine, which would suggest that uh, it has some chemicals in it that would be useful. Uh, and and uh, have lots of Asclepius or, or uh, milkweeds. And yes, the insects are there, and uh, rather wonderful, and they're very interesting to watch. Uh, uh, every once in a while we have an orange milkweed. Orange milkweeds don't tend to uh, last very long. They, they last two or three years and then they get a grub in their root and, and they die. But they do uh, produce seed and they do like uh, sandy areas like in uh, uh, the south end of Lake Michigan there. Uh, which is very sandy, does grow uh, orange milkweed. They're rather popular because they're very easy to see and they're rather interesting. Uh, you can see some of them in a horticultural prairie that goes with the uh, the big dig on Second Street. They're, they're planted there and, and they're doing well. Uh, along with another, a few other species, uh, doing some formal grass, grasses and some uh, iris, iris in a damp spot. Uh, I'm watching cardinal plant because cardinal plant likes to be damp and that horticultural prairie that sort of butts onto University Avenue is rather uh, dry in the middle of summer and then too dry for cardinal plants. Uh, but a nice little plot sitting on top of the boneyard uh, it goes underneath it. Uh, so uh, it, it reminds us that a small formal horticultural prairie can be quite interesting. Uh, the grasses are uh, starting to show. They're poking up through the last season's litter, which is sometimes still erect, sometimes Dark districts will remove the the last year's litter. Sometimes we let it be. Sometimes it just falls and becomes fuel matrix for burning uh, the prairie. We don't have a lot of fuel at the uh, Pope Prairie near Rantoul. It's, uh, it's on a gravel pit, so the, the plots of prairie are coalescing very slowly. And as yet, they don't have enough fuel makers to burn. If you really want to do it, you can take in a bunch of hay, and that probably would be very good for that little prairie, because those accumulated clumps of a few species uh, growing back some organic matter and, and then allowing other more, more sophisticated plants to come in, uh, that's going on. and, and uh, firing of those pots would help. It would take away the litter. If you walk around and watch uh, for a compass plant, or you'll see a clump like that, and you will see uh, the north-south leaves, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, Cold grass is in wet situations. It takes about 10 years to grow from seed. That doesn't mean it's not germinated. That means it is growing and you don't see it developing roots yet. It's, uh, it's going to take a while to get to the point where you recognize it. So it's simpler there to put in phones 
but we haven't done that yet. We do have cold grass in other places. That, uh, it's a, a little bit uh, uh, controversial in the fact that cold grass allows the water to uh, sink in and for uh, farmers and others who want to see the water get off quickly, it can sometimes be a challenge. Uh, it is very strong leaf, and if you uh, get in with a uh, clump of cord grass, uh, you can cut your fingers if you uh, help yourself walk through with, with your arms and legs. Uh, in some places there's drop seed. Uh, the little uh, uh, horticultural prairie on University Avenue and Second Street has drop seed. Rather refined, and uh, but the, the grasses tend to sort them out with cord grass and damp place low on the moraine. Um, Indian grass, blue stem, little blue, switchgrass, and a medium range, more or less like what they would have had in the past. And then higher on the hill, bootaloo or side oats, and uh, little blue stem. Uh, there are asters, and at the end of the year, we have New England aster. And it goes right into November, and unfortunately, if if mowing is on the roadsides, and there's aster, there's a number of different asters, and they come at different times of the year. But there's a frost aster, which is fairly common, and uh, right into to November and December. Uh, on weed is. Uh, common in wet places and it grows late also. Uh, I want to say something about some of the iconic plants. One of them is compass plant. It's known well because it uh, it's big. It's noticeable. It's, uh, it can be uh, 8 feet tall, 10 foot tall, it, uh, it's a little bit like sunflowers. It, it tends to walk because their fruiting bodies are tall and they fall over. And if that falling is 10 feet away, then the next year there's another 10 feet away. Uh, so they can infill. Uh, sunflowers like uh, sawtooth sunflower, big, uh, tall sunflower, that maybe 10 or 15 feet tall does the same sort of thing. It falls over uh, almost purposefully uh, and moves around. Uh, the compass plant was instrumental for settlers. Uh, the human mind is such that uh, when you go to uh, from southern Illinois to Chicago, for instance, uh, you can go 100 miles and be back on your doorstep because our human minds tend to act that way. Uh, the way out is to find a north-south direction. And the compass plant does that because it, it, uh, its leaves face north and south. Not everyone leaves faces north and south, so you have to, in your mind, do a statistic. You get on the uh, pommel of your horse saddle and you look in the distance and you see these plants tall and then you go check them out and that gives you an idea of north and south so there's a, an interesting uh, situation here uh, and dark is a, 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 a relative a selfium and it has fruiting bodies uh, a little more refined than, than uh, compass plants it has uh, expansive leaves uh, uh, about the size of a, a, a shovel, round mouth shovel or something like that. Uh, they're tough. Uh, 
these are not creatures you use or leaves that you use for toilet paper. So they're very much engineered to survive drought. So they can make use of water. They will take up water quickly, uh, but they also can go through a drought. Uh, and that's one reason why they're, they're valuable because uh, w w as we look at sustainability, we need plants that grow locally and we need to know that we have plants that are economically feasible. So we have to think about these plants because uh, they are adapted to uh, wet organic soils like Drummer and Flanagan. And, and, uh, they adapt to climate too. I think it is a uh, compass plant that doesn't go too far north. Uh, uh, I think Doc goes further north. Um, it's either one of those two. Uh, well, the features of the dock are deep root, uh, maybe 15 feet. We've picked them out of railroad beds and the top two feet of weight up to 14, uh, 40 pounds. Uh, and the, the crown is 10 inches across. A lot of that is water, of course, so if you leave it hanging around for uh, six months, it will be shriveling up. But it's a substantial plant. Okay. It has leaves that are relative to the dock, but they have been invaginated. That means big pieces of leaf have been dropped out. Uh, that means that there's fewer stalemates for uh, water to be lost to the, to the plant. The, the stems are tough, especially on the compass plant. Uh, they're hairy to stop wind from drying them out. And they're also rosinous. And if you're a chemist, you have to imagine that sometimes a rosin might be a complex. You might want to uh, go to your lab and um, make a, a, a solution with alcohol and p put uh, them into a blotting paper which allows the, the alcohol to take that, that chemical uh, to a certain place. And then you can compare that with a, uh, a known uh, uh, chemical and see what you've got in this mix. Uh, th that can uh, extend to things like x-ray, uh, things like uh, uh, spectrophotometers, uh, getting little pieces of information, but it also costs. So here we have a library of, of materials that we have hardly tapped, and yet we're, we're prepared to lose it. So uh, you're going out to see what and commune with a compass plant is very helpful. Uh, uh, the compass plant enjoys it, and so should you, because it's part of your library of science. Uh, it has heavy fruiting bodies. If we have compass plant on a trail and it falls over the trail, then you have to push your way through it and you'll scratch yourself. Uh, so, it makes a statement about it. So, spread amongst these compass plants are docks, and and uh, uh, they they do well. Uh, uh, the dock a little bit more refined, uh, finer uh, flower. Both flowers are capitulums or heads. They're part of the helianthus or the, the sunflower type uh, sunflower. Uh, family. We also have legumes and they come some of them a little later. We've talked about prairie purple prairie clover, but uh, there's bush clover and there's lead plant and uh, both rather elegant and if we get time we'll talk about those too. 
Uh, one of the more popular prairie plants is also a garden plant. It's, it's bee balm, and it's a, a balm for bees. And they go there to get nectar and, and honey, uh, nectar and pollen, and they pollinate because they're bee balm is a mint and it has a flower that uh, needs to be uh, gotten down to and bumblebees especially are very good at that they're better at doing that than uh, Italian bees but Italian bees uh, kindly provide us with a hexagon type uh, hive uh, and, and you can harvest uh, in a manner that you can't do with bumblebees. Uh, the uh, South 45, uh, starting about now, will have some uh, bee bomb banks uh, along with uh, yellow cone flower uh, and leatris. A bunch of other things too, but uh, when you're moving at 50 mile an hour, you don't tend to see other than the bank. But if, if you stop to really look and walk 45, you'll see these plants. Uh, you'll have to cross over a little ditch. Uh, and again, uh, where appropriate, probably because uh, the place has ticks and we don't always know where they are uh, sometimes they seem to concentrate in certain areas especially with the little literal already uh, uh, I have my notes here has uh, something that looks like a, a beard and it belongs it looks like a, a snapdragon flower but it's very popular and it's a riot at the moment in the uh, Scott Park area uh, now I want to tell you a little bit more about some of the other plants that we have I mentioned the rattlesnake master and I mentioned quinine uh, quinine is white. It has a seed that's hard as the hogs of hell. It, uh, you, you have to bust your fingers getting, uh, to get the seed to be distributing it uh, so you don't distribute a bunch of seed in one place. Uh, prairie specialists know how to deal with these seeds. And uh, prairie moon is a, a rather wonderful... Uh, nursery in southern Minnesota started out in northern Illinois with Doug Wade and Dorothy Wade and it, the son Alan took over and, and found a place in southern uh, Minnesota that was appropriate for a, a larger nursery they picked seed on railroad beds and uh, can provide you with plants as well as uh, seed and they can provide you with mixes so if you're uh, interested in uh, helping with prairie then uh, uh, prairie moon is is uh, uh, one of the original companies there are other companies too and i can't name all of them but there are companies that provides seed and plants in order to do that you have to have greenhouses and the like so you can start them early and have them ready for things like sales that grand very friends have uh, 
we didn't mention Asclepius or, or milkweed. Milkweed uh, come in a regular milkweed, a Sullivan's milkweed, and, and green milkweed. I've only twice seen a green milkweed. I was uh, at a botanical conference and somebody found a green milkweed and everyone had to come back and have a look at the green milkweed. Not a common milkweed, but they're, uh, they're popular for uh, the reason that they, they support monarch butterflies, but uh, uh, they, they're there. Uh, unfortunately, they used to grow in row crops, and many people who are in their 70s now uh, grew up as a child getting rid of uh, uh, milkweeds. And so one has to be tolerant of a change in attitude to a plant. You have to be careful of it a little bit because it has uh, juices and you can become allergic to those juices. Um, if you want to go to Bantul the, to see these sort of things in their primitive stages and in uh, a peak in, uh, in the middle of summer, uh, go through Rantoul on Route 45 and then about a mile north you will circle round a, a cemetery and then you will come to a, a section road number 3200. 3,200 north and you can run in there and it's the peak of a triangle of that road that went around Maplewood Cemetery. You can park on part of an old road, it's old, old Route 45, which we hope will become a prairie pathway. So I, I spent a little time there uh, this week and it's a very interesting site. Uh, it's on the Bloomington Moraine. South of the cemetery is swampy. North of the sw cemetery, still a little swampy, but you're getting to be on the slopes of the Bloomington Moraine and onto the peak of the hill. Then gently down to Ludlow. Ludlow was the end of the Illinois Central Railroad for a while, and there are history stories where families got off the train and didn't know how to handle the prairie and some of them lost the whole family lost one one family lost his life there because it was just too hard to find uh, civilization uh, probably stopped there because it there would have been had to be some railroad adaptation to get over the Bloomington Moraine and into Champlain and eventually that happened. Uh, but if you go east and west, you pick up uh, some of the rolling nature of the uh, Moraine. Uh, right next to us is a farmer who has lots of uh, waterlogged space because the glacial deposits um, um, were uh, uh, sort of a little rolling with outwash plain creeks that even gave more range. So I wandered east along the moraine. This is a continental moraine and it has a face that runs east-west. Uh, and I, I talked to the farmer. Uh, he was having to replant corn on that, uh, on some of those depressions. It's very hard to handle a depression. If you're going to drain the depression and it's, it's like a saucer, you're going to have to cut through the, the hill uh, uh, that surrounds it. Uh, uh, this is a perpetual problem with people who have farms on moraines. 
That's why they're not always cultivated. Uh, often you'll find livestock on the moraine. And I'm thinking that if we do eco-tourism and come uh, uh, south from Kankakee and stop off at places like Loder and Paxton and down to Rantoul, <clears throat> that a side uh, jaunt to get an idea of what the moraine is like it would be very good. So I went along and about a half a mile away, perhaps a mile away from our uh, Pope Prairie, there's a golf course, and it uh, golf is having uh, some difficulties these days. It's expensive and it's hard to keep up, and so there's been some debate, and I'm not sure what that debate has been, but <clears throat> there's been some turnover of ownership of the golf course. It's still being used, but it's on that moraine, and it has the character to to of the. Uh, depression areas and the, uh, an outwash Plain Creek that comes through it. Uh, so I was there with a the camera and, and took a photograph back just uh, uh, three quarters of a mile to our prairie and thinking that that would be a nice place to go to and to uh, enjoy. Go a little further and there's a uh, again, a rolling hills, and on top of the rolling hill is a uh, uh, landfill. So there's a hike there. You can be on top of the landfill and look down over Rantoul, believe it or not. And if you go a little to the next section road, uh, you will see fa farmland that is contoured uh, because of the uh, rolling nature of the landscape. And up on the hill there's a, a little uh, forest that sometimes can do quite well with, because it's well drained. This is a glacial till and uh, the Bagby family own four acres there and, and encouraged it and uh, actually harvested some of the wood there for uh, some building they were going doing. And uh, I think the Bagby family still probably owned uh, if you uh, go south you go past the south end of the Air Force Base and there's 80 acres of uh, prairie gum forest there uh, so you're, you're looking at how an eco-tourist could go a little west and come back uh, to uh, old Route 45 and it joins up with the east-west uh, punk and vine railroad line closed out from uh, Rantoul to Dillsburg and uh, three, three miles of that was donated to the to the uh, Rantoul city by the Fisher Grain and Coal Company. We tried to get them to, to uh, extend that uh, goodwill to Dillsburg because it was original prairie and we said that this is your original soil it hasn't been disturbed by uh, cultivation and chemicals and uh, we didn't get to do that so uh, i went past there and yes in some places you can see where the railroad had been in other places it has been lost that little railroad line went up over the hill to Gil uh, gilman Gifford, and uh, there the Grand Prairie Friends has a one mile uh, railroad prairie. It's narrow, it's not ideal, but it's a little piece of our only remaining prairie. At Dillsburg, uh, there are conservation groups that have uh, set aside. So we have places where we can go and a little further yet you go to Penfield and then you get to go to the northern northeastern part of the forest preserve district and a good swamp land that comes through from uh, from uh, Ford County which becomes part of the uh, Wabash or part of the Vermilion River that runs into the Wabash which runs into the Ohio and, and is a, a, an area of 
interest in uh, natural history and swampland, uh, and there's a cliff very near to the east and boundary of of the, the state that, that is very nice swampland, and it attracts migrating birds and uh, uh, birds that stay around. Uh, there's uh, the old railroad line went through, and one line went under the other line, and uh, uh, there are groups that have bought that area for hunting and fishing, and, uh, reserve and retreat. Uh, you should know about these places because they help you to understand uh, how we can connect and how, if you were a bumblebee, how you could get from place to place, or if you're a bird, how would you uh, sing and dance in unison with your uh, counterparts in perhaps another county. If you go west, you can do some of the same sorts of things. We go over to Foosland, uh, near to 47, uh, going north and south. Uh, you have a, a, a couple of railroad lines going through the corner of the county that are, uh, are loaded with prairie. And I see you should know uh, to look at those uh, in order to help to preserve them sometimes. I looked at some of these watersheds because I happened to be reading a uh, uh, 1961 uh, journal, medical journal. I, I've been tidying up and I came across this. And I must have saved it because there was a person named Evans that uh, grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, Went to school, a uh, fairly uh, uh, strict high school, which he didn't really approve of, and, but eventually got uh, a, a quality me medical science degree, and he settled in Attica. Attica is one of those towns that's in the middle of the Wabash drainage district. But this was a gentleman named Evans, and he was being written about by one of his grandchildren, I think. And while he was there, he started to get interested in people who had uh, mental problems, uh, established a, uh, a hospital in Indianapolis that uh, was a hospital for indigent people. He uh, had one foot in a uh, rush uh, medical school. His he bought uh, perhaps 400 acres of land north of Chicago, which became Evansville, named after him. Uh, I'm intrigued by people who uh, have the talent to to do some of these things, and uh, it's a little bit like the Morton family that. Uh, Morton Salt Company that started off in the east and moved west. Well, uh, this man watched uh, the disease of uh, I'm forgetting the disease at the moment, but it was it's a very uh, pernicious disease in it. It, uh, it uh, spreads and he was astute enough to notice that the spreading of this was according to the waterways which were being used and then by the railroads uh, and he became famous for sorting that out and and and, and sorting out the uh, opportunity to avoid this sort of situation very much like our own now uh, he was offered by Lincoln. This was a man that was born in uh, something like 1812 and died in uh, 1897. And in the process, he became uh, politically active and uh, 
Lincoln offered him several situations. Eventually, Lincoln convinced him, convinced him to, to be uh, governor of Colorado. So uh, he uh, did all sorts of interesting things in Colorado, and uh, he became uh, put together a university, and he was the head of it, and, and family members in different generations have also been president of that college. Uh, and uh, this family spreads out, and you have to wonder where, when we didn't have so many people, uh, we could do that. Uh, sometimes it was a little on the colonial side, so we have to watch how we uh, deal with uh, railroading and coal and uh, a lot of things that have becoming uh, controversial backgrounds uh, today. And we have to realize that our progenitors didn't always do things quite right. Uh, uh, and we have to think about what we do with some of the things that they've done. But in, in these cases where you have people who became leaders and uh, uh, we're also very brilliant people and uh, did the best they can could with the resources that they have in the era that they have. Uh, we're getting near to uh, leaving enough time for some advertising. We're always very glad to have the opportunity to uh, not only have a radio program with Swift, but to have a, a video program with a band of public television and, and to have that program put up on uh, on YouTube so it can be this program can be streamed on your computer or you can get it from YouTube we're not very big on uh, blogs and uh, social media but we really have to do that in order to promote what we're doing uh, uh, I encourage you to to get out there, even if you only drive in the car and don't necessarily go places. You will find little pieces of prairie along the roadsides. You will find uh, prairies like Prospect and and Loda that are easy to uh, observe without having to walk into them, uh, and you will be able to. Uh, introduce young folk to their heritage. It's not going to be a uh, old growth forest, but it's what we have. It's, it's what mellowed the, the glacial materials that were brought here, and it's really our heritage. So I look at sites like the landfill that I was sitting on and, and I was thinking this could be a prairie and this could be a prairie where you could be and look over Rantoul and realize that this country is not as flat as people think it is and there are these hills in fact I could take one road down the face of the Birmingham Moraine and I would think of, of uh, getting into a what I would call a billy cart. Uh, uh, that's a box with wheels on it where we used to compete. And you'd get onto a road and uh, you'd set yourself going and you'd jump into your box and you'd have a little steering event with the two front wheels and uh, the competition was to see who gets to the bottom of it. Fast. So there was a road. You, you could actually do that on. And, uh, I, I think we need to introduce those little places to people and introduce the biodiversity. We've got a lot of corn and soybeans, but we need to think about some of the other things that might just grow uh, interesting things, perhaps not as economically feasible, but still 
part of our uh, life together. So uh, I'm going to leave room for some other thoughts for worth the announcements. And thanks for listening. This has been Dave Monk, your Perry Monk, WEFT Champagne, 90.1 on your FM dial.